Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've made it into June and we're continuing on in our study in 1 Corinthians. We've now moved uh, out of chapter 7 into chapter 8 after looking at uh, the Holy Spirit's message concerning marriage uh, within the body of Christ. We're looking at something very special here, I believe, in the 8th chapter, so we're going to be talking about that. I hope everyone is doing well. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very aware of my limitations. Of We are so keenly aware of just how little we know. We also realize fully that you are our teacher, our comforter. I just would ask that you would filter out all of that which is not true all of the foolishness just sealing to our hearts, only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're going to look at, be looking at something here in the eighth chapter, I believe, that has uh, that deals with uh, knowledge uh, of what we know and what we don't know. Uh, love, grace, uh, freedom, and conscience. I remember reading a book uh, many years ago by uh, Francis Schaeffer, who was uh, one of the, uh, uh, I, I would say he was probably one of the world's uh, foremost Christian thinkers of, of uh, uh, a past generation, in which he always talked about freedom and form, and, and by form he meant law. And that uh, you couldn't have in a, in a civil society, you couldn't have freedom without having some form of law. You know, there has to be a balance, okay? If you don't have some uh, measure of law or form within a free society, then what you have is chaos. We know that as believers in Christ, we are under grace. We've seen that grace all through this epistle to the Corinthians. We know, uh, we've talked about, I've mentioned, uh, we've looked at just how carnal and fleshly that these Corinthians were acting. This first century Jewish church, which was primarily Jewish, not completely, but primarily. I mean, they met in synagogues. They were Jews. They were accustomed to the laws and the customs of their time and uh, the, the Judaistic mindset of these early Christians. And they had written to Paul, asking Paul a very particular question. Now we know this because Paul addresses that question. And so this had to do with, uh, in this eighth chapter that we're going, going to be looking at, it had to do with eating meat sacrificed unto idols. Uh, now, without jumping ahead, and I really hate jumping ahead, but Colossians 2, and I'm going to be, we're going to be looking at that here in a few moments. I believe that Colossians chapter 2 interprets 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, we also, we know that Scripture interprets Scripture. And when we look at this word meat, which is uh, actually, it's, it's, it's broma in the Greek, it's a general term for food. It doesn't, you know, it was translated meat, but the, literally the term means food, okay? Uh, anything that we would partake of, that would go into our mouth, uh, in, in, as far as uh, sustenance goes, uh, for, to sustain the physical body. And, uh, but the question that they could have asked, and I believe this is very important as we move forward through this introduction that I'm, I'm hoping to give to this chapter, it's important for us to understand that these people could have asked him anything. Uh, historically, uh, this was the question that they asked. If we were to confront our pastor, our leaders, our elders today with some question, it surely most definitely would not be this one because uh, I think it's safe to, to, for me to at least uh, assume that there's probably no meat market near you anywhere 
were that they're selling meat that was sacrificed unto idols. Now, I don't know, I have a few foreigner, uh, foreigners that are following this channel. They may live in places where that's happening uh, or something uh, similar, uh, akin to that is, is taking place. But uh, I can tell you for an absolute fact, I don't, I don't see any meat markets here in Oklahoma that are selling meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And so I guess, you know, I guess we can just skip over this whole chapter because, you know, it's go on to chapter 9. Uh, maybe maybe nine will make more sense as, as far as our, our present lives here is concerned because this just has nothing to do with us. And of course, I've, I've stressed repeatedly how I believe that God's Word is, is, uh, is timeless. It's not limited to time. There's, there's got to be a present day application here for us. How are we today as Christians living in the 21st century how are we supposed to read these words and make sense of them? Uh, they asked Paul about this. You know, it's, it's, it's like a church going to its pastor, its elders, its leaders, its, and, and uh, maybe writing the, the, the pastor a letter and, you know, and asking the pastor what, what he believes is allowed and what is not. And that's a key, key note, okay, that, that in, in all this discussion, uh, it's a vital uh, aspect of this discussion that, that sheds light, I believe, on everything that we're going to look at. I think it's more, it's about more than just food. It's certainly more than, about more than meat. And it's certainly more about more than just food. I believe that the Holy Spirit picked this, even though it was a question that they asked Paul. Uh, God uh, designed this, constructed this into His Word. Uh, he designed the very circumstance that led to the question being asked, which led to Paul's addressing this, which led to it becoming part of God's Word. Uh, this, the, but this is the question that they had. And, and our question, my point is, is that our question today would obviously be different. It may be something like, well, pastor, what, what about uh, uh, smoking? Is that, is that something that, that, it's, that should be allowed? I mean, is it Christians, are, are they permitted to smoke? Or is that something that's forbidden? Or, or taking a drink of alcohol, or you name it, okay? I think that's, what the, that's the lesson that we're looking at here. It's not as much about... And, and I do believe we need to keep this in historical context, okay? I mean, this was, this was their concern, but it's certainly not ours. Uh, of course, now, if you can imagine somehow, you know, someone, some meat company, let's say Tyson Chicken, or I don't know, whatever, you know, you know so they're, they're, they're sacrificing their chickens, you know, on some altar to some strange false god someplace and then they're packaging that and they're putting it on the shelf you know in the freeze in the freezer section or the meat section of your supermarket and and so you're buying that and you're eating that and is there something wrong with that and you know uh, this whole chapter folks is is a uh, it's, it's about more than just food. It's, it's not a course on social graces. It's, it's or dining etiquette. Uh, it's, or table manners, or, or, or what, what you should eat as far as, you know, food for the physical body is concerned, what you, what you should eat and what you can eat, what's forbidden, what's allowed. Uh, it, it, what it, it is about imaginary gods, okay? Uh, versus the one true God, which the text really emphasizes heavily, okay? We know, we know that there's only one true God. We know that these other strange gods are just a figment of their imagination. The, the word there in the Greek reveals the fact that these are just a figment of their imagination. They're imagined, they're not real, they have no substance, they have no power, they have no authority. They are absolutely 
made up. Okay? And we know that there's only one true God. But it's also about our allowing the freedom that we have in Christ to ruin another brother. We have been made free in Christ. We have, we have, we're free to eat all things. Uh, there is no law that says in the Christian's walk or life that says God doesn't present any law that says, well, you're, this is what you're allowed to eat. This is what you're not allowed to eat. This is what you're allowed to do. This is what you're not allowed to do. In fact, and this is what many, where many Christians get hung up, is they really refuse to accept the fact that Scripture says that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but I will be not mastered by any one thing or any one, depending on how you interpret that. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, nothing was unclean of itself. And, and so he might lawfully eat anything. Yet the, Paul is, is saying that they, sh, they should forbear and not make use of this liberty if a brother should be grieved by it or else should be emboldened thereby to eat and so wound and defile his weak conscience. The Holy Spirit of God is concerned here in this chapter about your conscience, okay? About your conscience being defiled. How can you rest? How can you have peace, joy, rest in, in the Lord when your conscience is defiled because you believe that you've eaten something or done something or said something or or because I believe it goes way beyond meat or food here. You've done something that God, you are absolutely convinced that God is displeased with you uh, uh, for, that you've, you've broken His laws, that you've, you've broken His commandments. And God's not really very happy with you right now. And, 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 but, but you see another brother involved in something that you believe is so wrong, so bad, so forbidden, and, and so that doesn't really much help your faith either. This is not how the body of Christ is to function and operate. It's a, it's, it's a breach of brotherly love when we contribute to the to wounding and the defiling of another brother's conscience as it regards our liberty in the Lord. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. This is a brother, okay? This is, there's no question in the text that this is a brother, okay? For, for whom Christ died. Now, that's a heavy statement. It, it carries along with it everything that his death implies and how that that death was applied, the effects of that was applied to that brother's life and to your life. It's, it's not eternal destruction. It's not destroying. You cannot, by any, by any way, you cannot cause another brother to become in danger of hell, okay, by what you do. That's not what the text is saying at all. The word there is ruined. His conscience is defiled. This is a, a weak uh, brother, a weaker brother. So it's about liberty. It's about liberty. And it's about how to use it. You know, if sure, we're, we're free in Christ. All things are lawful. Not all things are profitable, but all things are lawful. We each have our own scruples. We, we talked about scruples earlier in another series of videos. But if I allow my liberty to cause my brother to stumble, I'm not walking in love. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile, that is umpire, the word there is umpire, you of your reward and a voluntary false humility and worshiping of angels, which I believe are messengers, Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, that's forbidden territory. 
vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Okay? Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So that's, that's what we're looking at there in Colossians. Like I said, I believe Colossians 2 interprets 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So, here, here's the deal, folks. We're all going to get together. We're going to uh, argue over, debate over what's allowed and what's acceptable or, or not. Is that what we're going to do? Is that what you want to do? Is that what God wants us to do? You know, what's forbidden, what's not. Just toss grace aside and toss love aside. Toss unity aside as well not to mention Christ, just completely kick Christ out of the picture. Let's just toss Him aside because if our life in Christ is about a set of moral standards, folks, and keeping a bunch of laws and rules and regulations and living, walking according to the flesh, walking according to law, if that's what the Christian life is about, we don't need Christ. I want to read you a couple of verses here. Titus 1.15, To the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. Indeed, both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Romans 14.2, For one person has faith to eat all things, while another who is weak eats only vegetables. 14.2, Romans 14.2, 14.14 14 says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Romans 14.20, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but it is wrong to the man eating through a stumbling block. Romans 14.23, 23, and he that doubteth is condemned if he eats, because he eats not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I remind you of Acts chapter 10, uh, verses 9 through 15. Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, but he became hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And on it were all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the sky. And a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. Acts 10, 28. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Verse 7 here says, But not everyone has this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that they eat such food as if it were sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. When we get to the 10th chapter in verse 25, whatever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. 1 Timothy 4.4 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 4, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, 
forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, acceptation for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living god who is the savior of all men especially of those that believe these things command and teach let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation in charity in spirit in faith in purity till i come give attendance to reading to exhortation to doctrine neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself, that's not redeemed, that's deliver, and them that hear thee. This video was meant to be somewhat of an introduction into the 8th chapter. And big surprise that what we're, what we're looking at here in chapter 8 is a little different than what we've seen in the previous seven chapters. All we have seen is God's love, mercy, grace shown these believers at Corinth. That is not going to, content, to, to discontinue. That, is, that will continue all throughout the epistle into the next epistle and into uh, the next epistle. Because God's grace is is, is uh, unchanging. It's it's never ending. It's people have asked me, uh, Steve, what is what's the difference between uh, you know this this and when it comes to this whole issue of law and grace, okay? Uh, the, you know, the, keep in mind that the first objection. You know, always comes up. Yeah, well, Steve, I know if we're, I know, but if we're under grace, we're not law. I mean, I, I understand, you know, that we have this measure of freedom and liberty. You know, I understand we're not under law. We're, we're, we're under grace, but, but Steve, oh, Steve, Steve, Steve. I mean, you know, uh, what you're saying is that we can live however we want. And, you know, I used to I used to listen to hear that a lot, and I would think, well, you know, what an awful answer, you know. So that, it's actually a pretty profound answer. It's actually pretty accurate uh, because what it it states is the truth. It's the absolute truth. You can live however you want. You're under grace, and you can live however you want. You want to go rob a bank? Go rob a bank. You want to allow your freedom that you have in Christ to cause your brother to stumble? Go go right ahead. It's, it's that's it's your right. I mean, you know, it's your life. It's your decision. All right. I would not recommend that. Uh, what I would do is I would look at, at Christian freedom and Christian liberty as just for what it is. It's not a license to go and, and live however you want. It is the freedom and the liberty to worship God in spirit and in truth it's the freedom and the liberty to be able to worship God despite the flesh, despite the, uh, the horrible nature of the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. There, there is a God would not have us live in fear or in bondage or in, in servitude to, to, to a world system that is its entire message, its entire theology 
is centered around what man must do to please God. Okay? When we talk about our sacrificing whatever, our time, our energy, our finance, our money, whatever, our resources to take and appease an angry God, when we talk about our, us living our lives in Christ as if somehow we had to earn God's acceptance, somehow we had to earn God's favor, somehow in, in order to be free in Christ we had to meet certain qualifications, But we're obviously going in the wrong direction. We're going away from Christ. True Christian liberty recognizes that it, it comes with a responsibility. Can I eat all things? Well, of course I can't. Okay? But if, if my brother sees me eating all things and... and and says, well, okay, well, I, he's, Steve's doing that, so I can do that too. And so he does that. And now his conscience is, is condemned because he didn't have the faith to eat all things. Maybe you can understand the, the import of this chapter, the, the message that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey. It's not about meat or food at all. What it is is a continuation of a message by God the Holy Spirit in comforting these believers in Corinth, in trying to introduce them deeper, bring them deeper into the fact, into the reality that they are not under law, but they're under grace. These were first century Christians who were primarily Jewish, as I mentioned, and they, they, were, they were very accustomed uh, to such questions as they wrote Paul and, and asked of Paul. I hope you all will continue to uh, to study God's Word uh, in the time that we have left, whatever time that we have here, whatever God, time God has all allotted for us or allowed for us or designated for us to be here. I hope that, that you will not allow your your uh, your interest in in, a, in so many other things to to neglect the study of God's Word because, folks, that's where we get our peace and our joy and our comfort and our strength and our love for one another and, and our ability to assist and help one another along in this journey that we call life. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.